This is Seek the Lord, part four, leaders. Preach about the leaders. Father, bless us today as we preach about the leaders. In Jesus' name, amen. As I stated in the message, Seek the Lord, part three, when then becomes now, the text that we're studying was indeed a long-awaited and fascinating time in the history of Judah. That is when they were set free to go back up to Jerusalem, some 1,600 miles, go back up from the land of the Chaldees, up and across, down to Judah to rebuild the temple. As you know, the first, it is, Judah had fallen and there were three deportations of people. Uh, three times when Nebuchadnezzar attacked them and they deported people. The first attack took place in the year 605 B.C., and this was in the third year of King Jehoiakim. Read about this, if you will, in Daniel chapter 1, verse 1 through 4. 2 Kings chapter 24, verse 1 through 4. And you can also study it. Study this in Chronicles chapter 36. 2 Chronicles 36, 5 through 8. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar attacked Judah. And surrounded them. And uh, it was that time. That attack. That he took the precious vessels. The dedicated vessels. From the house of God. To his God. In Babylon. And put it in the house of his God. Shinar. Also it was in that attack. That he captured four. Very famous young men, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Along with other young people, he took those who had the potential to serve in his administration. That was the first attack. The second attack, which led to a deportation, or should I say second deportation, took place in 597 B.C. During the reign of Jehoiachin, the son of Jehoiakim. And, uh, of course, the third, and during that attack, they took away all the people who could possibly form a militia, possibly form an army. They deported all of the rich and powerful and influential people. They departed, they deported all of the people who could have possibly made instruments of war. Whoever could cause a problem, they took them to Babylon. After the fall of Jehoiachin, Nebuchadnezzar took his brother and put him in office and changed his name to Zedekiah. And at some point, somebody gave Zedekiah Foolish advice. Zedekiah rose up against Nebuchadnezzar. When he did that, that was the third uh, and final deportation that took place. It's called the fall of Jerusalem. That was in 586 B.C. And that was when the, wonderful, the beautiful temple of Solomon was stripped totally. But it was stripped in the second one. But it was burned this time. It was burned to the ground. All of the magnificent mansions of uh, Judah was burned to the ground. The infrastructure of the city was destroyed. Nebuchadnezzar paid, uh, gave no mercy 
to young men, old men, even those, the Bible says specifically, who stooped with age, who couldn't even stand up straight. He showed no mercy. It was a slaughter. And then he took uh, those who were left and deported them to um, Babylon. And the only people he left there were those who were extremely poor that he saw no need for. But our text takes place in the year 536 B.C., 70 years after the first deportation, which took place in 605. 70 years later, here we stand. Jeremiah 25 and 12, I want you to follow me on this, and we'll preach before it's over. Um, our text is God fulfilling his promise. Jeremiah 25 and 12 says, And it came to pass, and it shall come to pass, when 70 years are accomplished, that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity, and the land of the Chaldees, Deans, will I make a perpetual desolation. Now, if you study sometimes the writings of the prophet uh, Jeremiah, and uh, you will see that before the time came for God to bring the Chaldeans down, if you study um, chapter 25 of the book of Jeremiah, you will see what Jeremiah warns there's no point in trying to fight Nebuchadnezzar. There's no point in going up against the Chaldeans because God has anointed them for this purpose. No nation will be able to stop them. It's the same thing that he said in Habakkuk. He's, and Habakkuk argued with God and said, I know you're not going to punish the righteous with a man more wicked than he. And God uh, uh, go, uh, agrees with Rebecca and says, yes, you're right. The spirit in him is not upright in him. I'll admit that the spirit of Nebuchadnezzar is not upright. He's a wicked man. He says, but I'm going to still use him, but the just shall live by faith. So the things that I have told you that I'm going to do through this enemy nation, you may as well write the vision and make it plain that he that readeth may run because it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And it did happen. And it lasted for 70 years as God said. Jeremiah 29 and 10 says, For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good toward you in causing you to return to this place. 70 years, saints, represents a lifetime. Psalms 90 and verse 10 says, the days of our years are three score years and ten. That is, seventy. And if by reason of strength they be four score years, if by, by the grace of God you make eighty years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. So, he sentenced them to a lifetime in Babylon because of their wickedness. But I want to tell you something interesting. Here's what the God of the Bible said, however, about Babylon and their future. Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 11 and 12 says, Make bright the arrows, gather the shield. The Lord has raised up the spirit of the kings of the Medes. 
that is the Medes, the Medo Persian Empire. The Lord have raised up the spirit of the Medes for his device against Babylon to destroy it because it is the vengeance of the Lord, the vengeance of his temple. It was Nebuchadnezzar who burnt God's temple down. God says, I'm going to raise up a nation that's going to take you down for what you did to my temple. Isn't that something? And he says, set up the standard upon the walls of Babylon. Go ahead on and fortify your walls and make the watch strong. Yeah, fortify yourself. Build your military, uh, Babylon. Set up watchmen. Prepare the ambushes. Get ready. Do everything. For the Lord hath devised and done that which he spake against the inhabitants of Babylon. In other words, I raised them up to chasten Israel. But when I get ready to take them down, they're going down. Build your fence. Strengthen your military. Set up your watchmen. Do everything you can. But you're coming down. What does it tell you? God's in charge. He rules and he super rules. And he's in charge today. He's in charge of America. He's in charge of Israel. He's in charge of Russia. He's in charge of Mexico. He's in charge. Oh my. This is why you want to seek the Lord. So you'll know how to interpret the news. Because you can't trust the news. People who trust the media. Have had no dealings with the media. People who've had dealings with the media. Know that, the, that we don't have a honest media anymore. You can't trust any of them. I've had multiple interviews. I've had multiple dealings with the media. They don't come to you wanting your side of the story. They don't really come to you wanting a story. They come with a narrative. And if what you have to say doesn't fit their narrative, that I've had dealings with them. I've been interviewed many times. I know what I'm talking about. If it doesn't fit their narrative, then they will, they will either alter your story, leave out half of what you've said, or, or change your story altogether, or do stories about you and, have, and having never spoken to you. I've had all of these things to happen to me. Oh, yeah, because my position didn't fit their narrative. I'll never forget, I, I was interviewed by the News and Observer. I'm going to get back on track. And the lady asked me, uh, this is when we were fighting for uh, marriage, and she asked me, she says, uh, what would you do if you discovered that there was a homosexual uh, singing on your choir? And by the way, thank God for Sister Hicks. It's so good to see you. She was ill, but the Lord raised her up. God bless you. Welcome back. And I said to her, I said, I would remove that individual from the choir, but I would do that the same as I would do a fornicator, a, an adulterer, a thief, a liar. If the person was, was serial and doing this, I'd have to take him down. What she printed in the paper was, Bishop, Pastor Wooden said he would remove the homosexual from the choir and put a period right there. That's the way they do. They don't, tell, they don't say what you said. They say what they want to say of what you've said. Man asked me one time, he was interviewing me on another subject, and uh, uh, the, the, he brought it up. I didn't. He said um, uh, something about uh, Donald Trump. And uh, I said, my answer to the question he asked me was that that is a no brainer. And I gave the answer. He was interviewing me on another subject. He does the news that night and say, we have at least one preacher in Raleigh who agrees with what Donald Trump said, this was during the campaign, on a particular matter. And he quotes me giving an answer to the question, 
He asked me. But the question that he asked live that night wasn't the question that he asked me in here. So he showed me answering a question that he didn't ask. That's the media for you. When they say it's fake and you can't trust, the only way you will trust the media, people who trust the media have never dealt with the media. When I was invited uh, to be on, on the record, David Crabtree, he invited me and told me, he says, you know, I can tell, we're talking on the phone, what happened? I can tell that you read the Bible. You're a Bible man. Because he had seen me on another interview and they, I, they, they did a close-up. The man was really trying to do a close-up on my ring. But my hand was by the Bible. And what, what a ring has to do with an interview, you know, I, I could have taken that a little race. So, you know, a black man can't have a ring. White man sell all the jury. So you said a brother can't have a ring? <laughs> I could have I gone that way with it, see. But I didn't. I let it slide. And so he invited me to be on and put me off twice. So the third week I came, we did the interview. I'm in the lobby, and I learned for the first time that he had reached out and got a Methodist professor, a white lady, and to debate me and told her two weeks ago that she would be debating me. I didn't learn that she was going to even be a part of it until I got there that day. I said, okay, I'm telling you how they work. So we came, we came into the studio. We we're sitting there, and everybody's being introduced, and then it's 10 seconds to go. We're in this countdown, we're getting ready to go live. He says to the lady, this is your microphone. You talk on this mic. Then he brings another lady out of the control room and says, you talk on this mic. And I'm going to talk on my mic. Now, this last 10 seconds, 10, 9, 8. So I said, well, what mic do I talk on? <laughs> Not knowing that it was a setup. He said, oh, you jump in wherever you can. This is David Crabtree. and we're on. That's the way we came on. When it was over, uh, the, 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 the complaint of the people was, why did you give Wooden such softball questions. Why did y'all uh, let him beat you like that? It, it wasn't that they let me. They set me up to knock this big mouth black juggernaut off of his pedestal. But they, they didn't account for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Because when you have the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost will tell you what to say. See, that's what they didn't, uh, 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 and if you go and you look it up, all this stuff, you can read it, oh, look it up, it's out there now. You can, uh, you can see the interview. That's the way we went in. It's, and it wasn't race, it was a narrative. It was a narrative. We, we don't want what they're promoting, so let's try to make them look bad. Oh, you don't hear me today. You can't trust the media, but you can trust God. So this is why you got to know that the God of the Bible is the one. See, promotion comes from the law. He's the one who takes down one and establishes another. According to Psalm 75. Oh, I can give you so many more stories of how Praise the Lord, uh, they do. But you, this is why you got to keep your eyes on the God of the Bible. Yes. Jeremiah 51, 28 and 29 says, uh, Prepare against her the nations with, with the kings of the Medes, the captains thereof, and all the rulers thereof, and all the land of his dominion. And the land shall tremble, and sorrow for every purpose of the Lord shall be performed 
against Babylon to make the land of Babylon a desolation without an inhabitant. God says, I'm bringing them down. And in Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 30, the last clause, God said this through the prophet Jeremiah uh, prophetically about the men of Babylon. It says they, the men of Babylon, be became as women. That is, they will be demoralized where they can't even fight. Back, back in biblical times, you know, uh, men were more ma manly than they are now. I don't know what's going on with men now. I, I, don't, I don't get it. I don't get it. I, I don't. I don't understand. I just they're making us. They're making us. They're making us too weak. It's it's fashionable now for a man to be weak. Yeah, you hear all these. You hear all these. Uh, these uh, stories they're doing now on what it's actually called toxic masculinity. Treating a man as though and and see the bad part about it is the toxic masculinity crowd. The listen, parents. They uh, hunt, wife. They, they, they may not be able to hurt your husband. All uh, right, husband? They may not be able to hurt your wife, but you got to be careful of your son in school. Because what they do is they write up boys, come against boys, boys get expelled, boys get in trouble for acting like boys. Boys are rambunctious, boys wrestle, boys hit each other, boys, boys... Boys do stuff like that. And now, every time you turn around, boys are being expelled and locked up and, 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 and in trouble for being boys. And what they do is they train all the boy out the boy. So the next thing, what you, next thing you got, got is you got a little boy whose spirit has been broken by the time he's nine. By the time he's nine or ten, he's a girl. He's broken. He's ready for a Barbie doll. That's the devil. Make sure you train your boy to be a boy. Train him to, your, your, him to grow up to be a man. Why do you think, and, and black folk fall for it every time. I got to preach. Why do you think they're attacking the NFL the way they are? It's one of the last, if not the last bastion of masculinity. Where men can get out there and be men and crush each other. Oh, all of October, everybody's got on pink. And uh, every time now, you can't, I wouldn't want to play today. You can't tackle, you can't hit nobody. You just, oh, the game is changed. Oh, I'm telling you the truth. Said the men of Babylon will become as women demoralized. Amen. Another thing that was fascinating, that I found fascinating, and Rocky don't go far, I think I've made a few mad men and women. Because a lot of these girls not like these girly men. I don't know why. I don't know why. I don't, I don't, I don't get the attraction. Because I sure don't like no butch woman. Well, what I liked about Pam from day one was the way she walked. You know how she could. I, I, can't, I can't get it like that. And, and it's a good thing I can't. I was somewhere one time and a preacher did a, You know, he tried to mimic the women. And I told him after it was over, Doc, you, you were too good at that. What you been doing? Practicing? Say amen. I'm a holiness preacher. Another thing that I found fascinating is the number of exiles. I want you to hear me now. Who had not lost their desire for Zion. I'm going to preach in just a few minutes. They were there 70 years. There's an old adage that says, absence make the heart grow fonder. But if you go a little further, it says too much absence makes the heart forget. 
70 years they had been there. Ezekiel died in Babylonian captivity. Jeremiah died in captivity. Many of the prophets never lived to see the day. Listen to me, people. All of the adults, the aged and the wise adults who were carried into captivity, died in captivity. But they did a wonderful job. And thank God for Ezekiel because he helped out. Yes. Who They did a wonderful job telling the story of what God had promised. And passing it from one generation to the next. That's one of the things that hurt us as a people. We have no identity. That's why it's so easy for hip hop, anything crazy to come out, we gravitate to it. Any crazy how do, we gravitate to it. Any crazy trend, we gravitate to it. We gravitate to it. For we have no uh, knowledge of who we are. Yeah, uh, I, I blame us, I blame the government. They came in in the 60s with their, you know, they said they meant well. I don't know if they meant well or not. Because when they wouldn't help, it's bad when you won't hire the black man, but you won't give his family that government cheese unless he leaves the house. And before, before welfare, before the, the civil rights gains of the 60s, in the 40s and 50s, the black household, 95% of the black households were two parent families. We won these rights and we lost our fathers. And to get government money, we had to, the man had to leave the house. And it don't take but a minute for a boy to grow up in a house where there's no father. There's nobody in there to tell him who he is. Tell him who your grandmama and your great grand. Hey, boy, here's who you are. That doesn't take but a, just one generation. One. Just one. Now he's the product of that, and that's all he knows. And he don't know how to be a daddy. He don't know how to treat a wife. He don't know how to treat his sister. Don't know how to interact with other men. Don't know because he learned from the streets because dad was taken out of the house. That's a reason why. We seem to be so gullible to everything that come out. Tattoos break out. We got to have it everywhere. Earrings in men's ears. Every, here we go. Here we go again. Dreadlocks, Rastafarian, all these looks. We, there we go again. Don't even pull your pants up. We're down with that too. It's a, and the thing that gets me, eight years, black folk loved Obama, right? Loved him. Obama, Obama. Matter of fact, they made a song about it. But it, it certainly didn't seem to affect our fashion. Why, you didn't, I tell, why didn't you imitate him and dress up? Because God knows the man could dress. Why didn't you imitate him and look like somebody? Because he certainly did. Now, you never saw him in hip-hop clothing. You know what? I think that my preaching is too honest for many. But these, these, these Jews, yeah, they, they said, they, look, little baby just born. Soon as he could learn goo goo and gaga, you know what they said to him? They said, Zion. 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 Jerusalem. You're a Jew. This is a beautiful place, but this isn't home. Zion. Zion. Can I get a witness? Let's, let's, let's look at something. I'm going to show, show it to you in, in, the, in the scriptures. They didn't forget Zion. Amen. See, because I'm going to tell you something about God. 
See, it, excuse me, it takes liquidity to follow the law. See, because depending upon what the Lord is saying to you, things shift. Things change. So Psalm 57 and 7 says, my heart is fixed, O oh God. My heart is fixed. So you got to fix your heart to obey God. There's no telling what he may do or tell you to do. He's not going to go outside of his word. But you got to be set in the scriptures to obey. Set your mind to obey God. See, the most important thing today, saints, is the will of God. Amen. This is a key that the modern day believer has forgotten. The modern day believer thinks that God revolves around our plans. But the truth is we're to revolve around his. Right. When Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he said, will you pray to the Father? That the, among the things you said to him, I mean the top, is thy will, thy will. be done. And I just coming to God to, let me tell you what I need you to do for me. No, 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 forget that. Thy will. Thy will. Be done. Now, after you've established that part, then you ask him, give us this day our daily bread. See, most of us want the Lord to fit into our plan, our scheme, but he's not going to do it. The Lord has a plan. God has a scheme, and we've got to fit into the Lord's plan and the Lord's scheme. Are you with me? So let me show you something, and, uh, and we're going we're gonna to move on. See, depending upon what the Lord is telling you, your position may shift for a season. Notice in Jeremiah, we've talked about it, chapter 29, verse 4 through 7, he tells Israel, build in Babylon. Get married in Babylon. Succeed in Babylon. Have children in Babylon. Raise your children in Babylon. Pray for the peace of Babylon. Be good citizens in Babylon. Because that's what I want you to do right now. But if you read Isaiah 55. Oh my. Verse 1 through 2. He asks. Verse 2 he says. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread. And your labor for that which satisfies not. That passage was him telling them. Don't get preoccupied in Babylon. Don't get so occupied in buying, building, and living in Babylon that you forget me. So I want you to settle in Babylon. I want you to do well in Babylon. But don't overdo it in Babylon. Because I, uh, there's something that I want to do for you. See? Don't forget, praise the Lord, that we can't get too caught up in this world. The Apostle Paul said this in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 4, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has called him to be a soldier. But that same Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, he says in verse 31, They that use this world, as not abusing it, for the fashion of the world passeth away. And then in the 32nd and 33rd verse of 1 Corinthians chapter 7, he says, but I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, that he may please the Lord. But he that is married careth for the things of the world, that he may please his wife. Now notice, he tells us not to get too tangled up in the world. He tells us not to get too hung up in the world. But at the same time, if you're married, you got to care for the things of the world to please your spouse. What is he talking about? Balance. If you study Ecclesiastes chapter 17, verse 16 through 18, we warned against being too safe. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, chapter 7, verse 16 through 18 says, Be not righteous over much, neither make thyself otherwise. 
over wise. Why shouldest thou destroy thyself? So don't be too religious. Don't be so heavenly bound that you know earthly good because you will destroy yourself. Be not overmuch wicked, neither be, uh, neither be thou foolish. Why sh shouldest thou die before thy time? He says, it is good that thou shouldest take hold of this. Yea, also from this withdraw thy hand. Praise the Lord. For he that feareth God shall come forth of them. The point that he's making is you don't want to go too far to either extreme. Because if you do, you will destroy yourself. Are you following me, saints? Let's look at this. How they did not forget Zion. While living in Babylon. Verse uh, Psalms 137. Says, by the rivers of Babylon, where we sat down, yea, we wept. When we remembered Zion, we hung our harps on willows in the midst thereof. That is, we, we put our harps on the shelf. And they that carried us away captive required of us a song. And they that wasted us, that is, they that stacked the dead bodies of the Jews up, they that wasted us required of us myrrh, saying, sing unto us a Zion song. That is, they stuck the knife in, and then they rubbed salt into the wound. And they asked, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Then I heard him say this, if I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its cunning. That is, let my right hand lose its strength. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. Good God Almighty, remember, O Lord, the children of Edom. Uh, uh, in the day of Jerusalem, who said, rise, rise, that is, uh, destroy Jerusalem, destroy Jerusalem. See, the Edomites teamed up with the Babylonians to bring Jerusalem down. But the point that I want you to get here is that uh, they made a pledge that they would not forget Zion. You ought to make a pledge today that you're not going to forget the Lord. Don't let the world cause you to forget that you are a holiness person. Don't let the college campus make you forget that you're saved. Don't let a good job uh, cause you to forget that the Lord has been good to you. Don't let your pretty looks cause you to believe that you're above the Lord's holiness. So you got to remember Zion. Got to keep your mind anchored on the Lord because if the devil can make you, you forget, he'll destroy you. These people, over 70 years, they did not forget the promise of the Lord. Then Psalms 126 tells us of the joy that they had when the Lord brought them out. It said in verse 1, when the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. When the Lord delivered us, it was like a dream, he says. And then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Look at this thing. Then said they among the heathens, the Lord have done great things for them. The Lord have done great things for us. Wherefore we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Lord. Look at this. He said, when God delivered us, we got glad. It was like a dream. That is, it was like a dream that came true. I'm here to tell you, saints, that if you don't forget what God has promised you, he won't forget it either. And you have so much to look forward to when you're thinking about all of the promises of the Lord. 
Don't let the devil cause you to think that God has put you on the shelf and that the Lord will not use you anymore because God has work for us all. Job on his lowest day almost gave up. But then he remembered something. Job 14 and 13, Job said to the Lord while going through Tom, his worst trial, Job said to God, Oh, that thou wouldest hide me in the grave. He, he was going through and life was so hard, he said, God, I want to die. Put me in the grave and cover me up. He says, Put, bury me uh, that thou wouldest keep me in secret until thy wrath be passed. Lord, if you could just kill me and leave me dead until this painful episode in my life is over, I'll be satisfied. Oh, that I didn't have to live through this. If I could just die right now, I would be satisfied if you would allow this to happen. And, uh, and he says, until my your wrath be passed, that thou wouldest appoint me a set time. That is, after it's over, if you would appoint a set time to raise me up. And then he says, and then remember me. But then Job came to his senses. He said, if a man die, shall he live again? The answer is no. If he kills me, I can't come back. If he put me in the grave, even when the time passed, I can't come back because I'm dead and I'm gone. So instead of being uh, suicidal, instead of wanting to die, he said, all of the days of my appointed time uh, shall I wait. I will wait until my change come. Then he said this, thou shalt call and I will answer thee. Thou will have a desire, oh my, to work uh, of to the work of thine hands. Verse 15 is what I want you to see. Jo Job said, no, I'm going to wait on you. I'm going to wait because sooner or later you're going to call me. Because see, Job recognized that he was the work of God's hand. And that sooner or later, God is going to want to use me. See, you may not be used of the Lord right now. Right now, you may feel like the Lord has you on the shelf. But what you do in the meantime is you stay saved. You serve where you are planted. You do what the Lord tells you to do. For when the time is right, God is going to reach for the work of his hand. And then he's going to get you off of his proverbial chef and then begin to use you. I'm here to tell somebody you may feel overlooked. You may feel forgotten and passed over. And perhaps you may have been forgotten and passed over. But you hadn't been forgotten by the Lord. You hadn't been passed over by the Lord. Your, your time just hadn't come yet. So he's going to hold you where you are and keep you where you are until he's ready to do what he wants. Just make sure when he calls you, you're ready, praise the Lord, to step up. I want to be anointed when he calls me. I want to be strong, bring me up, brother preacher, when he calls me. I want to have my house in order when he calls. See, the worst thing is for a promotion to come and you can't take it for the blessing to come and you're not in a position where you can walk in it because you didn't stay consecrated. The worst thing in the world is to be out of place when God reaches for you. No, Job said, I'm just going to wait on him because sooner or later he's going to use me even though I may not be used right now. Uh, my day is coming and when he opens the door and when he gives me the nod, I'm going to step up and step in. I'll never forget a little short story that I'm almost through preaching. When I was in college and I wasn't starting on the football team, the man who was ahead of me messed up. And when he messed up, the coach finally called my name and said, Wooden, come in. I'm going to give you a try. I was running out on the field and a young man from Florida who was on our team called me and said, Preach. And I stopped and looked back and they called me Preach. And I said, Yes, sir. He said, this is your chance. 
don't blow it. And when I got my chance to start, I never gave that position up again. I want you to know I was, while they had me on the shelf, I was lifting weights, eating my food, going to practice, training myself, saying to myself, one day my chance will come. And when my opportunity comes, I want to be ready for it. Well, Israel was in, in Babylon for 70 years. They bought houses there. They had property there. They prospered there. They did good there. Oh, yes, they did. But they kept in their heart that the day is going to come when I got to leave here. They didn't get too attached to that place because they knew that the time would come that they're going to have to leave. I want to tell somebody, don't get too attached because the day is coming when the Lord's going to come get us and take us home. Don't you get too attached to the position that you hold because it may be on loan to you. God may want to take you higher. What you want to do is to have a good balance and just tell the God of the Bible where you lead, I will follow. And I'll go through for as long as you want me to. As I've been saying all this year, for some people, 2018 was your 70 years. It was a year of struggle. It was a year that you went through. It was a year that you had a hard time. It was a year of transition. But you kept in your mind, God made me some promises. You didn't let the devil cause you to forget what the Lord said to you. I want to know today, is there anybody here who still remember the promise of God? Is there anybody here who are still shouting on what he said he would do? It hadn't happened yet, but in your mind, it still gives you a dance because you know that God is not a man, that he should lie neither is he the son of man that he should repent have i not said it shall i not do it saith the lord it is impossible for god to lie whatever the lord says it's got to come to pass you may have to wait a few minutes on it ah, you may have to wait for a little while but how many know that there's joy in waiting. It's called anticipation. If you believe in who you're waiting for, it's a wonderful time when they tell you, when the tax man tell you that you got a check coming, you get all excited. You hadn't even received a dime, but you believe it because you believe that the IRS is gonna keep their word. Well, if you can trust the IRS, what about G-O-D? What about J-E-S-U-S? What about the Lord? Ah, the Lord! Ah, the Lord! Shake somebody's hand and say, he made me a promise and I'm, I'm holding him to it. So much so that I want to praise him right now. Yeah! Yeah, hello! Seventy years later, seventy years later, good God Almighty, he raised up the Chaldeans, he raised up the Persians, they defeated the Chaldeans. And then God stirred up Cyrus. And when he stirred him up, Cyrus made an edict and he put it in writing. If there's any Jews here, hallelujah. The Lord told me to set you free, to let you go down to Jerusalem, go up to Jerusalem and rebuild the house of God. And when the word went forth. Thank God for some saved folk 
who had ears to hear when the word went forth. Thank God for some spiritual people who've been working and who've been waiting. Thank God for some leaders for when the word went forth. The first people to step up was the leaders. The leaders said, this is God. The leaders said, this is the anointing. The leaders said, pack up, get ready to go because the Lord is keeping his word. I wonder, do I have any leaders in here? What about the leadership? Are you spiritual? Are you praying? Are you excited? Are you somewhere? Woo! I want the leaders to praise the Lord. Woo! Somebody shout, I'm a leader. I'm a leader. And this is God. This is his work. And I'm not going to be one of the last ones to respond. But I want to be among the first to step up and say I'm getting with what God is doing. The Lord told me to tell you that this is your year. That if you seek the Lord, he'll bring to pass what he promised. If you call on him, he will do what he said. But you got to be a sanctified leader. You got to be somebody who knows how to be in the right place at the right time. Not out of place, but in place. In place, our leadership conference is getting ready to start. And you got to be a leader in place a leader ready to pray a leader ready to fast a leader ready to live holy a leader ready to make a difference a leader ready to step up god starts with the leadership hey hey As soon as the announcement came, those who were spiritually in tune said, that's God. Start packing. Some others were talking about it. What do you think about what Cyrus said? I mean, man, I got a house. It's, it's too warm. I got a house. Uh, I have a business in Babylon. Uh, I'm in the midst of this and that. I don't know about this leaving stuff. I mean, I've never been to Judah. I was born in Babylon. I've never been down there. I don't know anything about that. But those spiritual leaders wasn't even talking. So what are you doing? I'm packing my bag. I'm packing up, getting ready to go because I recognize the voice of the Lord when I hear it. And the leaders moved first. We are about to go into a leadership conference that I want each leader to take serious. Hallelujah. Each leader has got to be in place. The rest of the saints too. But, and so, and when I say leader, I'm not just talking about a position holder. Because a lot of people have titles, but they're not leaders. Doesn't matter how many people have titles in a certain room. When the leader walk in, the leader can have no title. The person that everybody gravitates to, that's your leader. So 
And this, may, this may be the, the prince over here and the king over there and the queen over here, but they gravitate to this person. God is raising people up. But it's people who can see and recognize the move of God. You got to be able to see it, sense it, feel it, and know it right then and right there. And if you can move when God says move, if you can pack up when the Lord says pack up, when you can unpack when the Lord says unpack, you can shift with whatever the Lord is saying do. You're ready then to receive what the Lord has for you. Can I get a witness here? Glory to God. The Scripture says, my heart is fixed. Oh, Lord, my heart is fixed. We're, we're in this world, upper room. Listen, we're in this world. But we got to make sure that the world don't come in here and influence us and make us something other than a holiness church. Make us into a people that will not. Things creep in. You leaders, I'm, 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 tell, I'm, I'm telling you, um, we're trying to do something. We're trying to, we're trying to do, I'm trying to, trying to do something here. Now, if you're gonna help me, help me. But now, if you're not, don't, don't toy with me. Cause when it come down, you all know, you know, I'm not a thin-skinned person. Most people don't understand me when it comes to things like that. Because most people, uh, you know, wouldn't suffer the attacks that I have suffered online and stuff like that and in the newspaper and never say anything back. Most people ain't built that way. Most people don't have that kind of, it takes strength. It doesn't take weakness, it takes strength to not get into a back and forth and all that. And I'm talking heinous stuff. You, you, you all pay, you, you pay more attention to it now. Somebody have to tell me what's said because I just don't feel like I have enough days left on my life. And I think I'm going to live a long time, but I don't have enough days left to spend time and stuff like that. Life is too short. And, and, and to be honest with you, it doesn't interest me as much as the thing that I do spend my time in. But most people aren't strong enough to not respond right. stuff but now I'll tell you when I do respond when you hurt the church the church see the work of the Lord matters to me more than anything else you got to the work it's the work it's the work of the Lord who God brought Israel as a whole out of Babylon well nobody special in particular as a whole. It's the work as a whole. And when God calls you, your, your appointment papers tell you where you charge to serve. Go back home and read it. As your field, until the, the same person elevates you and show you, uh, you go to the next level, because God's taking people. But you want to be the kind of leader that until and unless until and unless, because number one, none of us know when Jesus is coming back. Number two, none of us know how long we're going to live. So we take a whole lot of things for granted. Well, I know what the Lord told me for the next six years. We'll see. You may not be in the next six years. That may not, that be, that, that may not be our here in the next six years. You have no way of knowing. But what you want to do is you want to be spiritual enough to see God's hand when the Lord make a shift. And you want to live leaders, preachers, in a manner where everything about you builds up the church. I got a call from a preacher, from a friend of mine, a grown man, 60, 
in his late 60s, weeping on the phone. He, he watches us online, and he gave such a compliment. He says, everybody there that I've seen that you featured preach like you. And they preach the same, similar word, you know, different texts and all that, but they see the consistency. And I said, thank God. That means that they see. The person who's disconnected is one you put up who come in totally in left field. I know what the pastor said, no, but God has given me something else. The Lord has told me that we'll seek him uh, later. <laughs> See, something just the opposite of what the Lord has said. You follow me? In our leadership conference that's coming up, we want to submit ourselves to the Lord so that we will respond to God's call the way they did. The chief of the fathers moved first, along with the rest of the people whom God had stirred. Who will move first? One of the worst things in the world is to be a leader, a leader, and when it counts, you're standoffish. Bishop Willard will never be able to say when I served with him that any time he stood and had to take a position on anything that he stood by himself. For if nobody else stood with him, I did. So much so that I got a call from the National Church because they accused me of being the one who put him up to do it. And I said, you apparently don't know Bishop Leroy Jackson Willard. Because if you know him, you know that no one puts him up to do anything. He follows God. But when he stood, I stood with him. And the thing that I didn't get at the time, I was looking around at some of the others that should have known to stand. I would have got up just for, you know. They didn't. As the Lord shift our church and make us ready for 2019 and begin to do these things, you want to be a leader in place, an alert leader. Not a leader who's who last one to get here. And let me tell you something. You lead all the time. You lead all the time. You lead when you're on, you lead when you're off. That's the thing about the serving the Lord. People, you, you, whether you know or not, you're always a Christian. Once you tell people you're a Christian, they always expect you to be one. I don't care if you got in a wreck, somebody ran to the back of your car, the front of your car, and the side of your car. They still want to see. <laughs> I want to see if they're going to be saved now. You're all, once you name the name of Christ, you're always a Christian. You're always on. At the game, wherever. You're always a Christian. So the Lord is calling for the leadership to step up. Leaders who say, preacher, pray for me. I want to move with God. I want to serve in my church. I want to do what is assigned. I want to make my lifestyle one of seeking the Lord leadership. I want to be a leader in God's work. I never, even before I got saved, I, I didn't believe in being on the back row. I like to be involved. I want to ride the pine. Amen. I like to be involved. Like to be where I could be in the action. And in being in the action, you ain't got to take anybody else's place. That room at the cross for everybody. I wonder how many leaders sense that there is something extraordinary going on. You who are streaming today, pray with us. Father! When you moved in Cyrus, 
the first people to rise up were the leaders, the chief of the fathers. They recognized that this was God. This was Zerubbabel and Joshua. Hallelujah. Their group. They were the first to walk out of Babylon. They left their houses, their land, their business dealings. For we know, uh, according to biblical and even non extra biblical evidence, that the Jews prospered well while in Babylon, that their numbers did not decrease. Their families grew. Hallelujah. And they left and made that long trek going back up to Jerusalem to do the work of the Lord. Well, God, here we are. You have given your servant a edict. You've given me a word to give to the people. That word is to seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. To seek the Lord. Hallelujah. Father, give us a seeker's mentality. That seeker's spirit. That seeker's heart. Let each seeker encourage his or her fellow seeker to seek the Lord. May I not get in anybody's way of seeking you. And may no one get in mine. Let us seek you as never before. Let us call upon your name as never before in the name of Jesus. For you are our God. You are our peace. and You are our song. God give us to navigate in this world to be saved and in the world but not so saved that we can't reach people that we can't succeed but I pray Lord that we don't get so caught up in the world's success that we miss what you're doing in the name of Jesus now, Father, we believe you. Father, we believe you. In the name of Jesus, we believe you. In the name of Jesus, we sanctify you. We sanctify our church work. We sanctify you right now. I pray for every soul on this altar. I pray that you pray right now. Lord, let us fit into your will. Let us fit into your will. Let us fit into your will. Not your will for our lives, but your will. Your will. You told us to pray that thy will be done. Your will. What will you have me to do? You would have me to obey your will. Hey! Make me and mold me that I might obey your will. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Now, Father, we just praise you now. And we give you glory now for all that you've done <clears throat> and for all that you do. In the name of Jesus, we praise you and we respond to you. We respond to you. Even on next week, when the conference is on, we wanna be in place. We wanna be in place. We want to be in place to do the will of God. The will of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Lift your hands to him and worship him right now.
glory to God. We worship you right now. We give you all the glory. We give you all of the praise. We give it all to you, Lord. We give it all to you. And we respond as leaders. Woo! Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glorify him in Jesus' name. The Lord told me to tell the leaders, leaders, lead. Lead in righteousness. Lead in true holiness. None of us are perfect, but when we fall, we get up and we go forward and we don't fall in the same thing over and over. Our pattern must be a pattern of success, a pattern of obeying God. See? Break that pattern, saith the Lord of hidden miss of up and down nobody's life is nobody's life trajectory is just like that because everybody have setbacks all lives have peaks and valleys but your life ought not to be like this that means you're not in touch with the Lord it means like we studied in class today in our 8 o'clock class we studied going into the counsel of God and standing in deliberation with God and you stand in deliberation and you deliberate with God until you learn what God is doing and you get God's heart and the Lord's mind on a thing as in Jeremiah chapter 23 and they stood in the Lord's counsel and Jeremiah said the problem with the false prophets was they never took time to stand before God. Said they developed their own sermons from their own heart and from their own dreams. So they started preaching stuff that they dreamed versus what the Bible said. And we're not called to preach dreams. We're called to preach God's word. The Bible says if you dream a dream, you tell it as a dream. You don't let nobody control you by their dreams. I told them in the 8 o'clock class today, if somebody come up to me and tell me, Pastor, I had a dream about you, and I dreamed that you died. I, uh, I told them, I said, well, give me 24 hours. When I see you again, I'm going to tell you I had a dream about you. And I dreamed that you died. And we're going to see whose dream is real. <laughs> Amen. Because the truth is, both of us are going to die sooner or later. But you can't all of a sudden call the mortician and get your black suit ready and stop living because somebody tell, had to tell you they had a dream. But now they can show you something in the scripture. It's a different game. But thus saith the Lord. God's calling us to a high place in him in Jesus name. God bless you. Give God praises today. Give the Lord praises today. Leaders praise him as you go back to your seat.